Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, George Leifman from uh, the Technion in Israel to uh, give a talk. George is finishing his PhD under the supervision of uh, Ayelet Tal. He also works as a core architect in Intel. Thank you, George. Okay. Thanks, Ayelet. Uh, so, as uh, he already <coughs> told, I am uh, from the Technion, I'm finishing my PhD now, and uh, my research uh, mainly focuses on geometry processing uh, problems in both computer graphics and computer vision. Uh, uh, the common topic of uh, all my works is uh, similarity for shape analysis, and uh, sure. I would like to talk about this topic, and let me start from uh, discussing each one of the components of the title. I will talk about what is shape, what is shape analysis and uh, what is similarity and uh, how, is it, how is it related to shape analysis. So let's start with the definition of shape. According to the Oxford Dictionary, shape is defined as the external form, contours or outline of, some, of someone or something. Uh, so when considering images, the outline of the shape is a curve. My research focuses on 3D objects whose silhouette, silhouette, silhouette is given uh, by the object boundary, which is the surface. Uh, the most common representation of surfaces right now is a triangular mesh, which uh, consists of vertices and faces, as you saw here. Shape analysis aims at developing, developing computational tools for understanding uh, the object shape. It is used in many application fields. Uh, in archaeology, for example, we want to find similar objects or missing parts. In uh, architecture, we would like to identify objects that fit to the specific space. There are also a lot of uh, other fields like medical imaging, security, entertainment industry, computer-aided design manufacturing, and many others. Uh, let me mention only a few specific uh, applications, those that are uh, related to the, my research and show examples of my work uh, on these areas. Let's start with the segmentation. This is probably one of the most popular uh, applications in graphics uh, for the last 10-20 uh, years. In segmentation, uh, the goal is to divide uh, a given surface into meaningful components. Here you can see on the left uh, a result of uh, our hierarchical uh, segmentation uh, algorithm from 2005. You can see the sumo warrior uh, segmented into the lips, the head, uh, the torso. And then each of these parts are further segmented in more semantic parts, like uh, the feet and the fingers and the nails. And uh, you can see the accurate hierarchy of each uh, segment. On the right, you can see a very partial uh, list of uh, papers that we was, uh, were uh, <coughs> published in the, this area in the last uh, decade. Another example is uh, of shape analysis topic is uh, matching and retrieval. Uh, so here, for example, you can, you can see a screenshot of uh, our uh, 3D uh, retrieval uh, engine. Uh, it's this engine uh, supports text and shape-based queries and also lets the user provide relevant uh, feedback. And in this case, I called it Jorgal combination of uh, Google and uh, George, and hoping to have the same number of uh, users, but we are still waiting from 2005. And uh, let's see. Uh, another topic is the uh, composition algorithm. So here in composition algorithms, uh, the goal is to construct 3D object by reusing uh, parts of existing objects. Uh, you can see an example of uh, work I was involved in, the, this, uh, our composition tool which gets, gets at the input to object, in this case, uh, object of a uh, human of a uh, horse, and only by applying a few quick operations, you can get a centaur here on the right. And finally, let me discuss the third component of the title, the similarity. Uh, similarity 
measure the resemblance uh, between objects uh, or between parts of the object. In particular, for all the above problems and uh, that I told uh, that I talked about before and uh, many other problems, uh, determining uh, similarity is essential. In some cases, uh, object similarity is needed, and in other cases, vertex similarity is necessary. So for object similarity, each object uh, is represented by a descriptor, and then this descriptor characterizes uh, the object uh, semantically, geometrically, or topologically, and then we measure the distance between the, uh, the, the similarity between uh, the objects by measuring the distance between the descriptors. So in this case, in order to say if uh, the horse is similar to the camel, as we just uh, compare the appropriate descriptors. Uh, in case of vertex similarity, uh, it is done by representing each vertex by descriptor and then comparing the descriptors in the, in the same way. Uh, many various descriptors uh, were recently proposed also for object uh, and vertex sim similarity. I will not go to the all of them, but let me mention only a few of them. Uh, so for global object descriptors, uh, this is a, sh a partial list and of uh, many cases. For example, the light field descriptor from 2003 was uh, uh, known uh, to out outperform uh, other uh, descriptors for many years. And in this case, it considers the object similar if they look similar from, uh, from all viewing and angles. And to build a vertex descriptor, the local vertex descriptor, uh, a vertex is associated with a histogram or the, with a feature vector. And this uh, vector characterizes the geometry of the neighborhood of the, of the vertex. Here you can see, once again, a partial list of the descriptors of the popular, uh, popular vertex descriptors. And uh, I will discuss some of them later when I make use of them in my work. So uh, my research focuses on shape analysis problems at the base of shape similarity, as I told before. And I can classify my uh, work into the four main uh, fields. It's uh, matching and retrieval, reconstruction and composition, segmentation and colorization, and cell density detection. Uh, I will start with uh, briefly des describing my latest work on reconstruction and uh, colorization. And then in the second part of my talk, I will focus on uh, the one problem, which is the uh, silence detection of uh, 3D objects. So let's start with the reconstruction of relief objects from line drawings. With, this was a joint work with Kolomenkin, Shimshoni, and uh, Tal. And given a line drawing uh, of an uh, object, as you can see here on the left, our goal was to automatically produce a 3D object from it, as you can see, uh, the rotating object here on the right. Uh, our main application was the reconstruction of archaeological artifacts based on the line drawings and the reports. While many findings might have been lost or destroyed over the years, uh, the illustration re remains in archaeological reports. And therefore, the only existing Input for the reconstruction is the line drawing. OK, this problem is uh, challenging, and, due, and uh, it's due to the following reasons. First, uh, the lines are usually very sparse. And uh, thus, the object is not fully constrained by the input. Second, the line dr uh, drawings are often very ambiguous. And uh, it, the line can have uh, different geometric meanings. For example, uh, they can in indicate 3D discontinuities, ridges, valleys, 3D step agents, and other uh, stuff. And finally, the input may consist uh, of very large number of strokes. And the uh, algorithm must be efficient to handle them in uh, normal time. Uh, our, we partition our reconstruction problem in uh, two sub-problems. First, we constru reconstruct the base. And then on top of this base, we reconstruct the relief, as you can see here. Uh, the main idea of the base reconstruction, which is based also on similarity, is uh, given the silhouette of the object, 
we look only on the outline of the object and define in the, da in the database a 3D object which, which is uh, most similar to the silhouettes of the drawing uh, on the picture. And uh, then when we have the most similar uh, object uh, based from the database, we, we are trying to deform it to better match the drawing. The second part, the relief, relief estimation, is uh, based on the idea of computing the rel relief by reducing this problem to the topological uh, graph sorting. Uh, by the way, just uh, in the, yes? Uh, for every input, you always get this side and then bottom. Is that what we're looking at here? It depends on the archaeological report, but uh, in some cases, we have only one view. In some cases, most of the cases, we have two orthographic views. In some very, very complex cases, we see three views uh, from three orthographic uh, views of the... But in so. all of them, you, you have some something like this, a plate or sauce or whatever, and the task is breaking sure at the bottom. Like, do you ever have ones where it's like a cup or a vase, and you want to reconstruct the side? Yeah, we have a vase. I, I, I think I will show some examples of the vases. But in, th in this case, our algorithm works with uh, three inputs. It can work only with un one input, and can probably work with two or even with three. Okay, so when you say base, you don't mean the bottom. You mean no, I'm, I'm not saying a base, I'm, I'm talking about this. The smooth uh, object which doesn't contain any relief. So yeah. essentially what we do, we take these uh, two, dra two drawings, we get only the outline of each each of them. And according to the outline, we find in the database the most uh, similar object, smooth one. It. When we find found uh, found it, we deform it to match the original drawing even, even better. And then we have the smooth base. We take the second step of the relief estimation. We get the relief and put it on the top, on top of the smooth base. Okay. Uh, just. I was just uh, wanted to mention that uh, la last week in the CVP I saw very similar uh, work of uh, reconstructing uh, 3D objects from images by Silvio uh, Savariz uh, from Michigan and uh, they also used some kind of the pr prior and try to deform it uh, uh, to get uh, better uh, 3D objects. So, in our case, I think when using a database, it should be even to, uh, easier to get uh, more uh, accurate results. Okay. So I'm not going into, into the details. If you want, you can ask me or see the paper, but I will show only a few results. For, for example, here, it's a part of the Roman oil lamp. As you can see here, the outline of the object and then the relief on it, and both you can see that also the object and the relief. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see places in the very gentle, probably very small curves that are not in the final relief. Uh, it's not in black because the, the, uh, because the geometry is not fine enough. The, what's the reason for this? What, for instance, what exactly in the bottom of the flower, just between the two this dolphins, one? Yeah, this bunch is not mm -hmm. represented. You have a small uh, stuff so, here. So without going to details, I, I was just curious if this is because the resolution of the geometry is not fine enough to create this, or yeah, it's probably because of the pre-processing what we do on the of the image. The image here is pretty. Ah, so you lose them in the pre-processing. Yeah, probably okay. most of the, you can see here are two or three of them, but. Okay. During the preprocessing, we need to, f to, to get all the edges. So mm -hmm. we just uh, run uh, edge detectors uh, on, on, on the image to understand where, where the lines are. So some of them, are, this one uh, got, got lost in, in the process. Uh, but in most of the cases, you, we will see the fine uh, details. For example, here, uh, also here, some of them are smoothed by Another result is also the full Roman oil lamp, and you can see here a uh, relief of the horse and the outline of the object, and both are pretty similar to the original one. Uh, this one. 
We don't, we don't have the ground truth. The only stuff that remains is only the, in the archaeological records. Artifacts that you have, both the artifact and the drawing, to see if this... Uh, in some, we, we didn't have uh, any of them. In some of the cases, uh, along with the drawing, you have a picture of uh, a photo of the, of the object. And uh, we tried to compare it, but most of the comparison was done uh, manually. It looks pretty similar. Uh, we tried, to be, even now we are working on uh, another work, uh, how to use also the drawing and, uh, and the e photo uh, in order to enhance uh, the result and to see it, to make it better, and may may also may maybe to put a texture on the, on the object, but it was not in this uh, specific work. So we can see here another uh, case of uh, the relief on the ways. And uh, this was uh, the question you asked about the ways and the top and the bottom. So in this case, you also hear that uh, the outline of the, of the object is similar. Example of what did the formation, how did the original database object uh, look like? We have it in the paper. I don't think I have it here in the, the presentation. I can show you. In the paper, I have the, all the steps. Steps. So in this case, uh, I think the vase was uh, very smooth, uh, without any ed those edges, without uh, those edges. So it was just a goblet with a with a, with a smooth uh, uh, bottom. And uh, all th on this. Like no, this? in this case we didn't use this uh, assumption. If you use it, you get better result. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, when you look on this object from uh, from the top, you see that uh, the circle here is not complete uh, circle, but it's uh, it's very similar to it, but it's more an oval. Uh, since we didn't use the uh, object surface revolution, if you put it inside, it will be uh, complete. Uh, uh, so in this case, you have a lot of uh, lines. I think in this case, we had uh, 500 or 600 lines uh, that needed to be accurately reconstructed here on the, uh, on the relief. And all the lines are interconnected, and it has uh, its challenges. OK, so <coughs> this was the first topic. Now let me talk briefly describe the our colorization uh, work. And uh, we have uh, two papers uh, on this work. So in general, colorization is a computer assisted, assisted process of adding color to black or white images or movies. In the past decades, a lot of colorization were proposed in computer graphics and computer vision. And uh, here you can see a pretty popular uh, work of uh, Nat Levine from 2004 where uh, by adding only a few scribbles on the, on the image, as you can see on the left, and you run their algorithm, and you can see this uh, pretty nice uh, image, on, uh, colorful image on the right. Uh, we extend this approach to the, to the surfaces in three dimensions. Uh, usually, meshes and surfaces are textured by images. By, but in some applications, we don't really need the rich textures, but rather require colorization by a few, only by a few colors. An example of such application is paint reconstruction of ancient sculptures. Uh, so here you can see a hand-painted uh, uh, result of the reconstruction of uh, the statue of Caligula. So essentially, they made a replica of the original stage, of the original statue, and uh, took uh, a color brush and uh, colored it uh, with uh, different colors uh, on, on, the, on the object. We propose an algorithm that can perform this task fully automatically in the computer. So here you can see an example of applying our algorithm. You can see a statue of a uh, Greek point being colorized uh, iteratively using our algorithm. We start by scribbling two colors uh, on the, on the left, and the system propagates the colors to the rest of the, the mesh. And the 
uh, hair was uh, colored in brown. Now to make the poet more, more alive, we add the uh, red to the hairband and uh, pink to the uh, lips. And you can see that in a few, less than a few minutes, we have this result on the right. Use so the original and all the like the original color that colorization work diffused Which the this this, uh, uh, this one no not work yeah uh, okay. diffused the changes in in um, saturation and value according to the change in intensity exactly. Exactly. so how do you guys how do you change the uh, I will talk about okay. this one so. The extension from images to meshes is not straightforward. It is due to following issues. The main issues are the uh, to the following one. First of all, the cho choice of points to get the same color. So in 2D, as you said, it, was, it is done according to the intensity. So if you have two neighborhood pixels, if they have the same intensity, gray color intensity, it's most likely they will have also the same RGB color. In the case of the... Uh, 3D meshes, we don't have any intensity channel, only the geometry. And the second challenge is uh, the color bleeding, which uh, occurs on also in the images. So in images, uh, uh, the technique is uh, to use the uh, edge detection and by using the edge detection to avoid the, the color bleeding. And then meshes, most of the edge detection te algorithms uh, generate very broken curves and it cannot be used. So, in order to uh, overcome these problems, for the, in order to choose the points, the vertices that have the same, uh, neighborhood vertices that have the same color, we use vertex similarity. So, essentially, we have two vertices which are uh, characterized by descriptors. It characterizes the geometry of the neighborhood of the vertex. And then, if, the, if uh, two vertices are similar, uh, fr uh, from the point of view of the geometry, we say that uh, it also should, this vertex should have the same, same color. And uh, this uh, assumption leads to optimization problem, and the result of the optimization problem, similarly to the Anout Levin work, is the colorization itself. The second issue of uh, uh, color bleeding avoidance is uh, here we uh, propose a novel direction field on meshes. Uh, so here you can see, uh, for, for example, uh, a color bleeding from one uh, range to another since we had uh, a gap in the edge of the 3D edge. So we propose to use the direction field and uh, what we do is that we uh, uh, direct the, the, uh, the vectors of the direction field to be to get the opposite orientation, then they have, then they reside on the different uh, sides of the, uh, of the of the edge. So we can see here that uh, the const the simple constraints uh, are here. And in this case, we just uh, want the uh, field to be smooth. So all the green lines are generated automatically, and as a result, you have uh, this field. And then this direction I used to penalize the similarity measuring the <coughs> of the, the neighborhood vertices. As, as a result, you don't have here any spilling of the color. Field? What? How do you generate that field? Diffusion? Hmm? Global optimization? And that's the diffusion. So in, in general, you have a, a, th those constraints. So along the feature line, you have the, the blue or the, or the black ones, the arrows. And then we want uh, the whole field to be uh, smooth, and as a result, we have uh, all the green lines. Okay. And once again, I'm not going into the details, but uh, just show a couple of results. So this one, a statue of uh, Goliath, David on uh, Goliath. So only with uh, a small number of strokes, you can see the colorization result on the right. Uh, Another example here uh, of uh, pretty complex uh, mesh. So 
So you can see here, for example, that uh, the fingers uh, and the ways are separated and uh, it works nice. And now another uh, problem that uh, uh, the dress, the red dress had a lot of uh, multiple folds. Uh, in other words, many convexities and concavities and still a couple of uh, strokes uh, across it managed to colorize it without any problem. Uh, another example, this one is uh, the, uh, the most complex one. So here you can see many characters in different poses dressed in a variety of uh, ways, holding each other, and all the features are high, uh, highly interlaced here. And still our algorithm with uh, around 50 or 60 strokes, we colorize the whole uh, scene very, pretty much very accurately. Okay, so the, the main drawback on the, of this algorithm was uh, the fact that uh, when we have uh, patterns, it cannot be, in order to colorize the patterns, we need to add the color on each instance of the pattern. For example, here to colorize this octopus, we needed to put the uh, uh, color of, on each of the suction cups. So it's possible, but uh, it took me around uh, half an hour to put a color on each one of them. And so this year on the CVPR, we, uh, we had a work that uh, handles this uh, problem and uh, proposes an algorithm that can do it automatically. So here you can see a vase with uh, different pat patterns and uh, only by uh, scribbling on uh, once uh, on each on, si on a single instance of each pattern or and around it, it's enough to colorize the whole uh, uh, surface ac uh, according to the pattern and to have the colors on, on these cases. You can see by the way that uh, not all the instances of the same pattern are identical. We have uh, reflections, we have uh, uh, small scale deformation and uh, even uh, some of the cases had the uh, non-rigid deformation and still algorithm overcame these problems. Do you have a sense of how invariant uh, the algorithm is to which pattern you select? What do you mean? Well, the, you see your input is all it, the ones in the center, which also are I generally the ones. It's uh, pretty arbitrary. We could also get the one in this uh, here. So why did I put the input in the center, not in the side? Well, no, no, my question is more like, do you have any sense of when this starts to break down? How different do the patterns have to be? Yeah. I, I will show some of the limitations at the end that will show that if the pattern is very uh, different, it won't work. But uh, as long as you... Uh, the algorithm is robust to, fully robust to uh, transition, uh, translation, uh, uh, reflection, rotation, uh, robust, Algor is algorithm is robust to scale, fully robust to scale, but the implementation, in order to implement it in the reasonable time, it's robust only to the 2x uh, sizes of scale, since uh, the search in the specific windows and more than that it was... Uh, For example, these patterns were now on uh, concave surface, would that still color Yeah, it should, it should color okay. um, Most likely, yes. Um, so let me talk about the main uh, steps of the algorithms. So given a 3D object uh, here, this is, is here you can see a zoom to the previous uh, surface. Uh, given a 3D object, the user scribbles only uh, on, on, on one instance and around it, and then uh, what we, do, we we produce a couple of automatic strokes. In order to produce the automatic strokes, we use uh, first of all we describe uh, we characterize each vertex here with a descriptor, and then we classify these descriptors with uh, in accordance with the pattern they are inside. So as a result, of the result of the classification is those automatic strokes. As you can see here, not the whole surface is, uh, has uh, labels here, only part of them. 
since uh, it was enough to get only the results what fully, we are fully confident in to, in order to get the colorization. So, so the last stage is applying the colorization from the previous paper on these automatic strokes, and we get this result. OK? In the paper, of course, here not, but uh, I can say it in a couple, a couple of words. Uh, first of all, we perform uh, for each vertex here, we perform a quasi segmentation by using the original colorization. So if you look here, we run for, from each vertex here uh, colorization algorithms whose input is the, the yellow strokes and the, the brown ones. And as a result, you, you, you can see here that the region of the goblet is colorized in, fully colorized in brown, and uh, the rest is not. So the first, uh, we, and we perform it for, for all the vertices. OK? And as a result, we have uh, for each vertex uh, uh, some kind of a region that uh, it, it's, uh, it, dis it describes it. And this region is uh, very similar to the region of the original pattern. OK? And now we produce two descriptors. One of the descriptors describes the region itself, and the second one uh, characterizes the curve that bounds the region, regions. So for the region itself, we, we use the PFH descriptor, uh, point fast histograms uh, from 2008, I think. And uh, essentially, it's a descriptor that uh, um, use, do I have a, no. I don't have a slide about it, but essentially it's a descriptor that uh, uh, it, it is 3D histogram, which uh, uses uh, uh, for each uh, pair of vertices, each uh, the uh, uh, angular and uh, relationship and the relation between their normals. So essentially it's uh, inst for each uh, pair of uh, vertices with uh, their com corresponding normals, instead of using the whole uh, how three, three coordinates for each vertex and uh, three coordinates for the normals, instead of using 12 uh, numbers, uh, they use only three angles which, uh, between this uh, 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 pair of vertices. So we use this descriptor to describe uh, the region. And in order to describe the, the boundary, we use torsion and the curvature of the boundary. And then we start with, with the classification process. The problem here, I think I have uh, the problem in classification is, first of all, the number of training examples is very small. So in order to, uh, to enrich the number of, po of the positive foreground examples, the brown ones here, it was pretty simple. We can just uh, use the colorization and to understand which uh, points are uh, as a, as a positive examples, the foreground ones. But uh, for the negative examples, it's kind of problematic since uh, we don't know on this, on where starts this, uh, the next instance of the pattern. So we can do just a flood fill here. And uh, because of it, we, we used bootstrapping uh, for the for enriching the number of examples, we used one class SVM on the on the region descriptor, and by that we found uh, more uh, positive examples, more uh, brown brown labels. But the problem of using only one class SVM, which uses only positive examples, training data, that it also found uh, many uh, false positives. So, for example, on uh, in this case. In addition of adding uh, the brown dots on other goblets, we also added some brown dots on, on these uh, flowers. And then we use the second descriptor, which is, uh, uses only the boundary of, this, of, the, of the shape, and uh, to filter out all the cases where, uh, where was, where, which were uh, uh, incorrectly uh, classified by the one class SVM. And as, as a result, we had uh, only the cases of uh, uh, positive examples right, right here. Okay? 
Uh, another problem of our case, as I already uh, told, is the mis misclass misclassification is uh, totally unacceptable, since if we have only one misclassified input stroke, it can finally lead to the wrong colorization of the whole surface. So in order to overcome these problems, we don't classify the whole vertices, all vertices of the surface, but classify only the ones that are really, we are really confident in them. And uh, in case of using SVM, for example, we can just take the uh, vertices that are very, very far from the uh, separation plane. And in these vertices, uh, we are very confident. OK. So once again, it was only a brief description of the algorithm. We are not going into the details, but as a result, you can uh, see here some of the results. So this one is a famous uh, 3D object of uh, uh, stars uh, on the node. And uh, you can see here then two strokes around the star and uh, two strokes on the star gives uh, uh, these results. With, uh, Pretty much all the stars were correctly colorized. Uh, to run or this one? This example is uh, around, I think, uh, 100 uh, vertices, and it runs in uh, 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And uh, for this example, more complex. And uh, you can see that uh, this piece of jewelry is uh, symmetric and it has uh, repeating reliefs on them. And uh, I uh, scribbled a couple of uh, colors only of one eighth of the, of the symmetry parts, and the whole uh, object is, uh, was. Uh, uh, so here, for instance, I see the same geometric shapes differentiate by scale only. So you will prefer to have the same scale if there are contradiction. Because you have two issues here. First, first as I told uh, before, uh, the algorithm is uh, scale invariant, but uh, the way we implemented it, the search uh, uh, window is uh, the same. So, for example, if you take uh, this li little uh, uh, ball and, the, and uh, the large ones, the algorithm will, will the implementation will uh, differentiate between these cases, but uh, in some cases we have uh, very similar uh, uh, circles, but also were uh, in dif uh, colored in different colors. And the reason for it is uh, the neighborhood of the of this uh, specific uh, uh, pattern. So. Yeah, I don't sure. I'm not sure I mentioned it before, but when I'm talking about the region that I describe, I describe the re, uh, character of the region of a specific uh, 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 pattern with its Im immediate surrounding. So in this case, for example, uh, you can see that uh, this green ball and this green ball are the same, but their surrounding is, is diff uh, different. So we needed to to make, in this case, to make them the same color, we needed to put a color on both of them. But uh, so just don't look just on the, on the balls or don't know circles. Also look on the surrounding of these circles. And in order to get the same color, also the surrounding and the pattern itself should be the, in, of the same color. So in some cases, it can be an advantage and the to user wanted. In some cases, uh, it's a disadvantage. Okay, another uh, case of this chandelier. As, uh, once again, only a few, uh, only a few uh, scribbles here. You get this result, which uh, all the parts, all these identical parts are uh, colorized. In this case, all the parts, is a cut object, it's all the parts are completely uh, identical. So it was a pretty simple uh, example. And another, I don't see here the, no, uh, okay, in the paper we have another example of, uh, of uh, the famous statue of uh, three elephants and uh, three creatures and uh, yeah, the, the Thai statue. Yeah. You use it in your paper, I think. Noise if I have 
So in this specific uh, object, uh, it was a scan object and uh, it had noise. So uh, I, I can see, say that oh, I don't have an example for it, but for example, if this one and uh, this instance and this instance were uh, it is noise and not completely similar, in most of the cases, up, and up uh, until uh, some kind of threshold, the algorithm can, can do it automatically. But uh, from the system point of view, sometimes you need to put uh, a color more than in one instance. An algorithm uses uh, as uh, runs on two instances. And if, for example, you have uh, 10 instances of the same pattern, and it varies, and uh, you have uh, two different of them, and you colorize the in them in the same color, the algorithm will uh, learn on both of them, and as a result, the colorize, the, colorize the all other eight instances correctly. So in uh, the specific Thai statue, I needed to colorize part of the twice or s three times on each, uh, on the same pattern to get the results since it was but scanned. What do you do with non-manifold meshes? It seems like it's non-manifold, at least in the chain. I don't have any problem with uh, non-manifold here. It's not connected, not manifold, but... Uh, I guess it depends on the shared descriptor, or what kind of descriptor you use in which yeah, but, uh, If it's not connected and not manifold, I just... Uh, the descriptor uh, will... Uh, I assume, for example, that uh, the parts that are not connected uh, uh, should be in the different uh, patterns. So you do use the topology? I do uh, use the topology, but if, if, you, if you have an object that uh, you have a specific uh, pattern which is uh, split it in two not connected uh, components, it won't work. Uh, or if, if it's split it in all the cases, it will just uh, identify this part as uh, two parts and colorize it correctly. So it looks like uh, the system is pretty sensitive to uh, kind of shut this creature to choose, like for example, how, where yeah. it's scaling variant. Yeah. and how global it is, how robust it is, mm -hmm. whether you would use the topology information. So I, I believe you must have tried out a couple of them. Can you yeah, we tried a lot of descriptors. Can, then you can you comment on some of the choice and why, why did you end up with using the one you chose now? I, I ended up using the PFH, and the, the PFH was uh, proposed for in the robotic community, I think. And uh, the main reason we use it uh, and not other descriptors is because of since it was very robust to noise. And uh, specifically, I'm not if I'm not uh, mistaken, PFH is working. It was designed to work on the point clouds without any connectivity okay. of the mesh. I agree with the question because this raises usually the the descriptors that are very good at handling noise. And usually the descriptors are very good at theoretically representing the geometry. In a lot of the cases, especially with the relief, most of the information from robotics will be considered noise because the relief is so small relative to the surface that usually if you are using binning of some kind, the beans will be yeah, but too, too small to, to, to uh, capture right. the things. But so. uh, exactly for th this one, the the point is, is right, but uh, I always I used uh, the search uh, window with the regard of the size of the of the feature I'm, I'm working it. For for example, the simplest case here, the ser the search window is uh, twice the the bounding box of the, of the of this case. So you're right if you're looking at the whole object. But if you are looking on something small, the whole scale will be different. So each case. Are you adapting to the scale automatically, or are you just putting it manually? Like this, for this object, to use a window of. No, no, uh, it's uh, fully automatically. Here I can see, uh, I, I'm, I find the bounding of the bo uh, bound all the strokes. And oh. then, uh, then I enlarge it by two or by oh, 1.5, so something like that. The user, by drawing yeah, yeah. the, the, the user, by, dro by drawing the input, Defines the size of the window size, uh, window size of the search. Okay. So, and essentially, it's uh, the right input. He's drawing around. The, uh, the instruction to the user is to to draw on the instance and around it. So, in this case, you can say that 
he could put the red uh, stroke here and the yellow one here. But it, wo it, w it wouldn't work. The instruction for the user is to, uh, to, to put the strokes of the background around the instance. And uh, as a result, uh, automatically we found the search window. OK, so it was uh, the colorizations part. Now let me recap uh, uh, the talk till now. Uh, I showed uh, algorithm of reconstruction from the lines, getting this uh, object with the relief. Then I showed the colorization algorithm that takes only the reconstructed object and by a couple of uh, strokes you get this uh, a nice colorful object. And now I will talk uh, a little bit uh, in detail on the last uh, topic, saliency, saliency detection and saliency based viewpoint selection. There, given this uh, object, we show the viewpoint from which uh, we can see the most informative view of this specific object. Okay, so this is the way I connect all my works. And so it was uh, oral CVPR on last year, last year. And uh, detecting uh, interesting or salient uh, region of an object attracted a lot of attention in computer vision and computer graphics in the last decade. Most of the work has concentrated on images and videos. And in this work, I focused on uh, the silence detection of surfaces. And uh, then I will discuss the second part, the viewpoint selection using this silence. So please took a look of this object. And uh, as a human observer, which part of uh, this object will you consider interesting? So according to our algorithm, the red regions are the most interesting ones, and the blue represents the least, least interesting regions. Uh, many problems in computer vision and computer graphics can, can benefit from the detection of uh, salient or interesting region of the surface. Examples are similarity, it's uh, your work, uh, icon generation, viewpoint selection, simplification, and I can talk about some more works. So uh, what are these interesting uh, regions? So, in, uh, in I, I, to I told that uh, a lot of work was done in uh, images and, uh, and movies. In for, three, for 3D objects, I'm aware only of three works. And uh, last year on uh, Sigraph Asia was the fourth work, I think, which is not in this presentation. But. Uh, so Lee et al. Uh, define a measure of surface silence based on the mean curvature. Uh, other works, uh, including Gall and Koenor, uh, detects region where the curvature of the surface is inconsistent with its immediate surroundings. And uh, therefore, they take into account the human tendency to be drawn to differences. In our case, we also look for uh, region distinctness, but uh, unlike prior approaches, we are trying to focus on not only on the local distinctness, but also on the considered global distinctness. Another interesting approach is, was uh, proposed by Shilani and von Hauser. Uh, and uh, in this case, the distinctiveness is based on the similarity between a given surface and the similar object in its class. Uh, for example, in uh, the case of the, of the animals, the, the ears of the Stanford bunny are unique to rabbits. And uh, thus, they can distinguish the bunny from the other animals. Uh, where the shape of the body is not very distinctive. And therefore, you can see that the ears are red and the rest of the body is uh, green or uh, blue. So our contribution is twofold. First, we propose an algorithm uh, for detecting the silent region of the surface. And then we present an algorithm for the viewpoint selection, whose goal is to make visible as much as possible of the region of interest. So our approach considers uh, three main principles. First, uh, since people are drawn to differences, we say that the region is interesting if it differs from other regions of the, of the mesh, both locally and globally. 
Therefore, we look for the mesh vertices that are distinct in their appearance. For example, the vertices on the index finger pointing to the mouse are very distinct in this case. Second, it was found uh, by Kim et al. that shape extremities are also considered salient. And examples of uh, vertices on the tips of, of the hairdo or on, uh, on the tip of the, f of the feet also should be considered uh, salient. And finally, uh, we consider the human tendency to be drawn, uh, uh, to tendency to group uh, close items together, and therefore regions that are close to the focus of attention are more interesting than the regions that are far away from the focus of attention. I will discuss all these uh, components and the way to realize them in our algorithm. So let's start with the first principle, the distinctness. Uh, according to this principle, we look for the vertices whose geometry is unique. First, we seek a descriptor that characterizes uh, the geometry of the vertex. Then we look for efficient similarity measure comparing the descriptors. And finally, we claim that uh, a vertex is distinct if its descriptor is dissimilar to all other vertex descriptors in the mesh. Uh, there are many ways to realize each of these steps. Uh, we can choose different vertex descriptors and different similarity measure. Now I will uh, describe our choices and uh, why we uh, choose them. So in this case, we examined uh, a lot of descriptors and found that the best uh, one that uh, achieves the best result uh, is using by spin images uh, from 99. Uh, spin images is uh, essentially a 2D histogram that encodes the density of the vertices. And more specifically, given a vertex V with a normal N, two cylindrical coordinates are defined with respect to V and N, the radial distance R and the elevation E, as you can see here on the screen. Then the spin image is created by quantizing uh, E and R, creating bins, and counting the number of uh, vertices in each bin. As a result, we have a 2D histogram of the vertex density. Uh, after choosing the descriptor, now we look the, for the similarity measure between the descriptors. So in our case, the similarity should be robust uh, to small changes in the mesh, like noise or remeshing or stuff like that. And we use a diffusion distance, uh, which models the difference between Two histograms is a temperature field. And specifically given the two histograms, in this case HVI and uh, HVJ, uh, we define diffusion distance D as shown here on the slide. We construct a Gaussian pyramid where each level contains the difference between the histograms. And then the final distance is uh, defined as a sum of all the L1 norms of all the levels, as you can see here. And uh, specif specifically, this distance is, uh, is considered a cross bin distance between the histograms, and it's uh, pretty fast uh, comparing to EMD, for example. Robust to what exactly? To what? You have a histogram. Okay. And in case of histograms, uh, there are al always you have two approaches to use uh, uh, bin to bin distance, which is fast but it has problems between uh, when you two similar bins uh, mm -hmm. because of the noise or because of the meshing, uh, it's, it's spares. Mm -hmm. Or to use uh, cross bin distance, for example, EMD, air smoothers distance, which is very robust to all these uh, small uh, changes in the histogram. But for example, EMD is very slow. Okay. For this case, is also, it can be considered as, as cross distance mm -hmm. since it uh, does the averaging over all uh, cases, over stages, and uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, finally, given the dissimilarity value D between each pair of uh, vertices, we compute the distinctness value of, of each vertex. Uh, we take a vertex and compare it uh, to all other uh, vertices of the mesh. And if, as you can see here, if the distance between the descriptor of this vertex and all, all other descriptors is, uh, is high, the vertex is distinct, as you can see here. 
and the colored in red. And otherwise, if it's in, if the distance is not high enough, it will be not distinct, and as a result, it will be colored in blue. Okay. However, in our case, since we want global uh, uh, distinctness, this con consideration is insufficient. Uh, we claim that the vertex is distinct when the vertices similar to it uh, are nearby and less distinct when the resembling vertices are far away. And this is so since uh, similar vertices that are um, far away can indicate a 3D texture. And hence the dissimilarity measure should be proportional to the difference in the appearance and inverse proportional to the geodesic distance between the vertices. And finally, we say that uh, vertex y, uh, vi is distinct when it's highly dissimilar to all other vertices. And in different scales? We use it in different scales. All the computation is then uh, used in different scales. So it's distinct if it's in, at least in one scale it's, it's distinct? We just average between the scales. If it's distinct in one of them, you have a high score in the one of them. Finally, it's uh, only in the uh, even after averaging, it will be high score in the one. We try different approaches also by taking the maximum and uh, in the end uh, putting the average with the best uh, result. Okay. So until now, we define the distinctness of the vertex, which was uh, the first principle. And uh, it took the, into account the dissimilarity to other vertices and was weighted by the geodesic distance. The second consideration was the uh, shape extremities. As, as you can see here on the slide, the red dots are the shape extremities. The question is how to find these red dots. So we use the following approach. Given the object, uh, we first transform it to pose invariant representation. As you can see here, given this dog, we transform it to pose invariant representation. Then we determine uh, if it's uh, a limb-like or not limb-like object. And finally, we find its extremities. Let me discuss each of the steps. So first step is uh, multidimensional scaling of the 3D. Uh, in, a case, uh, in this case, multidimensional scaling is in, th in 3D transforms the mesh such that the Euclidean distances between the points on the transformed mesh bec become similar to the geodesic distances between the corresponding points on the input mesh. Okay, as a result, you can see that all the uh, parts of this monkey are straightened uh, up, like, like a fold tail and this type of that. Okay, uh, so here we have a scale invariant uh, representation of uh, this monkey, which in ignores, fully ignores this pose. Now, uh, to decide whether the object uh, has a limb-like structure, we know that the volume of the round shape is similar to that of its convex hull. But the volume of the limb-like object differs from the volume of its convex hull. Therefore, we utilize a procedure which wo works, a very simple one, which works well in practice. We compute the ratio between the volume of the convex hull of the MDS to the volume of the object. And if its, its, its ratio is uh, high enough, we say that our object is limb-like. If it's uh, low, similar to close to one, we, are, we say that our own ob object is not limb like. So it works nice. And now for the cases of objects which are limb like, we want to find ex the, the extremities. So given the limb like object, first uh, we say the vertex is extreme if it satisfies two conditions. First, it resides as the convex hull of the MDS transformed mesh as shown here on the left. And second, it should be a local maximum of the sum of the geodesic distance functional as shown here. This definition uh, derives an algorithm for computing our extreme uh, vertices. And given a mesh S, first we compute the convex hull of its MDS transformed mesh. 
And then among all the uh, vertices which resides on the convex hull, we find all the, only the, those ones that satisfy this specific condition. And as a result, we have this uh, extremities uh, marked with the red dots. OK? So until now, we calculated the distinct and the extreme vertices. And the final stage of our, our approach is we take into account the fact that the visual forms may possess one or several centers of gravity about which the form is organized. Therefore, the region that are close to the focus of attention should be more interesting or more silent than the faraway regions. We model this effect as follows. We define a fraction of vertices with the high, highest distinctness value as the, as the focus points as shown on the left here. And the association A of the vertex VI is uh, defined as a function of the distinctness of its closest, uh, closest focus points and, to, and as a function to distance to this point, as you can see here. And you can uh, see it as a small Gaussians around each of the focus points. OK, finally, we integrate all the results together of the algorithm by applying this uh, formula. And the degree of the interest of vertex VI is defined as the maximum of the distinctness D uh, and the extremity E taken into the account association A. The result here is shown on the right. Let me show some results of the sal saliency of the object. So uh, again, the regions that the color in red are most interesting, most salient, and the blue ones are the least. The least. You can see here that uh, in the most of the cases, usually the expected silent region uh, are found. For example, for the dog, uh, our algorithm finds the facial, fe facial features, the feet and the tail as interesting. And you can see the, the facial features are the most interesting. For example, for the chest set, the chest pieces are more interesting than the board. And then you can see the unique pieces like the knight and the queen, kings and, kings and queen are more interesting than the regular pawns since there are many regular pawns and less unique cases. By the way, why symmetry, like in the dog's eyes, it introduces some of the uniqueness of the eyes? It introduces some of the uniqueness, but not uh, all the uniqueness. You have only one point on the second part and uh, you sum it over uh, the whole mesh. And, and in the previous example of this angel, uh, you have the risk that the hair, which has curls in it, the more uh, interesting geometrically will steal the attention. Right. Uh, that the face actually wasn't that interesting. For, interesting for us, we, we know semantics, but not for yeah. the geometry. So, so first of all, our algorithm has nothing to do with high level features, right. only the low, low level ones. But for example, in the case of the hair, since we have, you can see the 3D pattern on the hair, we try to reduce, uh, e even though it's very interesting from the, very different from the geometrical point of view, we have a pattern and uh, because of the regularization by uh, dividing the, by the geodetic, geodetic distances, we reduce uh, the, uh, the silence of the hair. This is considered as a pattern. Okay, so here you can see some uh, comparison. So it's a good thing that uh, Gal is not here. He can says his results was <laughs> very, not very nice. Uh, so for example, for the frog, you can see that uh, the facial features were correctly uh, found as uh, salient and also the feature on the the limbs, uh, similar result you can see on the, the camel. Uh, this slide compares to Lee et al. for 2005. Also, once again, uh, you can see that uh, since they are using only the curvature in their case, the results are much more uh, noisy and uh, every curve has uh, uh, salient. In our case, results are more concentrated on specific uh, areas and uh, for example, here, the body of this dinosaur is less, uh, uh, less uh, uh, silent than the, in their case. 
So till now we, uh, we showed how to co uh, compute the saliency. Uh, now we demonstrate the utility of this uh, salient uh, region in the viewpoint selection. So the goal here, given a surface, is to select the camera position from which uh, the most informative view is seen. In fact, we do even more than this. We automatically find the minimal set of views which jointly describe the surface well. For example, here, two views. The key idea is to maximize the area of the uh, view region of interest. As demonstrated here, we select a viewpoints which, that collectively describe the different regions of uh, interest of the object. So in this case, two views were sufficient to describe the whole object. I'm not going to the, all the details of the algorithm, but uh, it is based on three main principles. First, uh, uh, we wish to our viewpoint to reveal as much as possible of the salient region. And for that, we sample a set of candidate viewpoints uh, on the bounding sphere and evaluate the quality of each viewpoint according to the size of the uh, region of interest it reveals. And then the best candidates are refined. Second, a viewing angle is also important. So the contribution of each uh, region is weighted according to the angle between the surface, normal, and uh, the viewing direction. And the weight should be high if the, air, uh, if the area of the region uh, uh, occupies in the projection is high. And finally, uh, we should account to symmetry. There is no point to show two viewpoints of symmetric region. So for example, in this case, uh, the first viewpoint was selected by algorithm is the front view of this uh, statue, which reveals the maximum interest. And then it uh, reveals additional view from the back, which jointly with the previous one, reveals the whole, most of the region of interest to this uh, specific uh, object. OK. Uh, for example, for this uh, Buddha statue, we needed a three, three uh, viewpoints to fully describe the object. And you can see that uh, each uh, of these uh, viewpoints reveals new information. And in this case, we needed three. And finally, only one viewpoint was generated for this Utah teapot, which captures uh, both the top side and uh, the top and, and the side. And uh, here, a uh, single viewpoint is sufficient since uh, the bottom of the object is not interesting. And uh, it also illustrates the uh, consideration of symmetry, where since the teapot is perfectly sy symmetric, there's no point to show it from the other side. OK, and uh, here we compare to some of the state of the art results. You can see here that uh, our result on the top uh, much more natural than the results on the bottom, and all the cases. So, silly question, but if the, the upper ones is your, your method? Yeah, upper one is If I take the same object and just rotate it by... Ah, okay, I didn't mention it, okay. but uh, in all the algorithms that uh, found the, the viewpoint selection, the rotation is uh, not defined, so we rotate it in the manual. So the, oh. the only thing your algorithm found, it's only the viewpoint yes. you're looking from, and the rotation in the plane of the projection is uh, fully okay. not So found. when you compare to Ulaga, is using only the selection of the view direction, using the same uh, measure of uh, importance? Or, uh, they don't use importance for different sailors. They don't use saliency for, for viewpoint selection. In this case, Laga uses. Uh, maybe they don't. I don't remember the, uh, the exact details. How. So, what was I? I, I only remember the best science paper. What was this paper? It was paper only. Well, what did they try I, to. I, I, I think they tried to use curvatures. For what? Uh, yeah, for viewpoint selection. Okay. This paper was only on, on the viewpoint. Okay. They used curvature. They can say it's similar to the okay. salience. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this one, 
also compares our uh, result to other three results. Uh, as you can see here that uh, we think that our result is better since it's a three quarter view which is uh, popular in uh, art and stuff and uh, reveals more information than only the side view. Um, so in addition to the comparison we, we did, we also tried to uh, do it uh, more uh, quantitatively. Uh, so there is no available uh, ground rules for the best viewpoints. So we conducted a user study. And the goal of the user study was to evaluate our algorithm against uh, the views considered uh, as, uh, as informative by the human uh, observers. Uh, so we conducted the study as follows. Uh, for each of the 79 objects, we produced 12 images, uh, taken each one from the different viewpoints, sampled uh, uniformly on the sphere. And we asked the evaluators to mark the most informative uh, views of the object, and each evaluator can, uh, uh, could mark uh, more than one view. We had 200 evaluators and obtaining 68 evaluation and average per object. And uh, for example, uh, for this object, there are three, three views were considered informative by the evaluators. Two of them are symmetric. And to assess the result of our algorithm, we compared our, our uh, uh, view we, we found uh, against all the views here. And since the evaluators could choose only between the 12 viewpoints, our result considered uh, correct. If it was closer to the one of the viewpoints, then it's uh, to other not selected by the users, and uh, 75 out 79 uh, objects uh, were uh, correctly found. And let me show the example of uh, the four cases uh, we missed. So for example, in this case of the tank, uh, the most silent features are indeed uh, here on the top of the tank, but uh, most of the evaluators wanted to put it uh, in the natural position. It reveals less uh, interesting points, but we all know the tank should be so on the ground. Map. This is an important map and the viewpoints we, se we selected. And this is only the user study. Viewpoint. And the wheels are not considered too important because yeah, since you have uh, five uh, in each side, so it's too nice. It's not distinct. Not distinct. Okay. But uh, you would want to show at least one of them in a case like that, right? Not necessarily. Uh, well, what, what do you mean? I mean, something, it could be something that appears a lot in the object, so it's not interesting in the sense that it appears many times and you don't need to see it in many times, but um, right, at least seeing it at least once, Please. I think. Yeah. You are right. I, I agree with you, but are you saying that this is what they did? Or this no, no, they no. It's a philosoph philosoph uh, philosophical question, but yeah. in our case, if it's something that uh, appears a lot of time, a lot of times, we don't consider it, it's even one of the indices, we don't consider it as uh, interesting and don't uh, show it in this case. Um, so let me conclude this specific, to uh, specific uh, work and then I conclude the whole work, uh, the whole uh, talk. Uh, we introduced a novel. Uh, Algorithm for detection surface uh, region of interest. Uh, the algorithm is based on uh, three considerations, local and global distinctness, shape extremity as, and patch association. Uh, we showed how to realize all these components and how to put them together. And then we showed uh, that uh, region of interest can be a significant input to many computer uh, vision uh, application and we showed the uh, viewpoint selection application and uh, also uh, showed that it's better than most of the state of the art results and uh, also it reinforced by our user study we conduct. And finally, let me recap the whole talk. Uh, the whole talk. I showed that similarity is important aspect uh, for many shape analysis problems. So first, I showed uh, how we construct uh, a 3D object from a line drawing. And for this, we use uh, object similarity, global object similarity to retrieve smooth base from the database. And then we reconstructed the relief on top of this. And then I described a couple of colorization algorithms uh, that employ vertex similarity to design which vertex 
should get the same, which vertices should get the same color. And finally, I've shown uh, a silence based viewpoint selection algorithm, which uses similarity to compute vertex distinctness, and this is the result. And uh, this concludes my talk, and thank you for the attention. Okay. I'm not sure we have more questions. Let's scroll. If you have more questions about <laughs> the details, I have some backup slides I can show you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hold the video?